Hello, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome again to Syriana Analysis. I'm your host, Kirk Almasian. I'm very pleased to host today Carl Za. He is a political analyst, historian, and host of Silk and Steel podcast. I've been following him on Twitter, and he is doing an impressive job, guys. His Twitter account and the podcast are in the description below. Please go follow him and show him some support. He's doing an incredible, incredible job on the Chinese uh, affairs, uh, Chinese foreign policy affairs with other countries, but also uh, on Ukraine and uh, and Russia, let's say about multipolarity. Carl, thank you very much for accepting my invitation. It's a pleasure to have you on my channel. Thank you very much. And I must say, I, I actually have been a long-term fan of you. I have followed your Twitter account uh, throughout the uh, Syrian civil war because I consider you one of the most reliable uh, voices. And, 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 and you are obviously an expert in uh in terms of syria so i i rely upon your expertise to find out what is going on outside of the mainstream media which i absolutely do not trust thank so you thank so you much again. carl i'm very humbled by your words i consider uh, such statements and testimonies as a fuel uh, for me to continue doing what i do because at the end of the day i leave the war in syria and i truly want other countries not to uh, pass through similar experiences and especially now in ukraine we have we have been following for example the afghanistan war and how it was about an endless war for money laundering operations and not for to win this war as also assange clarified it multiple times and according to wikileaks we have seen endless a number of documents prove that the United States uh, was plotting against Syria and there was no organic uh, uh, revolution against a dictatorship as they claimed. It was about a regime change war. So I wanted to put all these perspectives into action and also uh, draw parallels with Ukraine, China, Russia and other uh, growing economies because we want uh, sustainable peace. Even with the United States, we really want to live in peace and harmony with all the countries, but we ju we're just asking one simple uh, demand. Please do not intervene in our domestic affairs. That's all we ask from uh, the United States. And now Washington and the Biden administration, they sent uh, Antony Blinken, the Secretary of State uh, of the United States, to China. And uh, they hold uh, hours of talks, right? And just after uh, Blinken left the country, Biden gave a statement calling Xi Jinping a dictator. And I want to just go back a little bit and want to remind uh, our audience that there was a Minsk Agreement 1, Minsk Agreement 2, that uh, later uh, Angela Merkel and Holland said that this was just uh, uh, to buy time for Ukraine in order to uh, arm Ukraine and uh, getting ready uh, for a fight against Russia. Um, there was uh, a year ago a draft uh, uh, agreement called Ukraine's uh, Permanent Neutrality Agreement that uh, the representative of uh, Ukraine negotiating team uh, has put its uh, signature on it. There was a nuclear deal with, uh, with Iran that the United States withdrew from its side. My question would be, what the hell is wrong with Western politicians? How can we trust them after all these um, setbacks and uh, also stabbing other countries in the back? Well, you can um, you know, Confucius said, listen to one's words, but watch their actions. And that's what we need to do. We, you know, words is cheap. And the fact that they, after sitting through seven and a half hours, uh, the Chinese prime, uh, Chinese foreign minister, Qin Gang, actually sat with Blinken for seven and a half hours of conversation. After all that, Biden just come out and say, yeah, she is a dictator, right? And and this is uh, this is kind of the action that's not very reassuring. Um, and and the U the the U S come out and say they want to stabilize Ch U S China relationship, but we have to recognize who has been destabilizing the U S China relationship. It's co not coming from ch China. Or the mainstream media will tell you that's because China has been aggressive in the past uh, whatever since Xi Jinping came to power. Um, what they don't tell you is that. U.S. has been deploying its military asset to Asia since the Asian, uh, the pivot to Asia that was started under Hillary Clinton when she was a Secretary of State under Obama, and the the pivot to Asia. There's no economic uh, aspect; it's all military, and. The United States, U.S. Navy sail up and down South China Sea and through Taiwan Strait, claiming so-called uh, freedom of navigation. And one of the main justification they use is that 
they're protecting a very vital sea lane to the world economy. You know, six trillion dollars worth of traffic pass through South China Sea. What they don't tell you is that overwhelming part of that traffic is to and from China. So essentially, U.S. Navy is claiming they're protecting China's vital sea lanes from China, which is obviously ridiculous. And this is just this year, the U.S. Uh, warship has conducted three sail throughs of the Taiwan Strait. Um, you know, you, 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 people can see from your map how far is the island of Taiwan and the Taiwan Strait is from U.S. mainland. Actually, and, I wanted to show this map uh, to tell the people how close China has put its country to the American <laughs> military bases. <laughs> How dare they? How dare those <laughs> dastardly Chinese uh, challenging the U.S. hegemony everywhere? Um, <clears throat> so this is a background. This is a background. It's not China is very open to do business with the West, including the United States. I mean, this is why China has invited uh, top business leaders like Elon Musk and Bill Gates and, and have Xi Jinping met with them. So... <clears throat> You know, I, I like to say because China understands United States better uh, than United States understand China, because China knows U.S., despite its claim to be a liberal democracy, it's really a plutocracy. It's a rule by the wealthy. So <clears throat> why talk to all the, <clears throat> excuse me, my I'm losing my voice a little bit because I'm still adjusting to the time zone in Russia. And <laughs> Good health and for so, you, my friend. So why, if the U United States is uh, ruled by billionaires, what's the point of talking to functionaries and middlemen like Lincoln and uh, and Biden? You know, just go straight to the top. Just talk to Bill Gates and talk to Elon Musk. And in fact, a lot of the U.S. business community is also very eager to do business with China, but not everyone. Because there's also a very vital and, and big business community in the United States that's called the military intelligence industrial complex. And they're the ones who are main beneficiary from any kind of tension with China. Um, in fact, Pentagon has been painting China as a boogeyman even since uh, 1990s. After the dissolution of Soviet Union, when everybody was expecting the United States will receive a peace dividend by cutting military budget, uh, that's when the China threat became a thing. They, they start yeah. to paint China as uh, someone will fill the shoes of a former Soviet Union so we can keep the Cold War going. Uh, but obviously, in 1990, China was still a very poor country. And, and it's, it's a little bit ridiculous to claim that. China in 1990s somehow the, the the Soviet of the yes, yesterday years. At, at the same time, um, a lot of the U.S. business community they are kind of uh, chomping at the bits to exploit the Chinese market because uh, there's one billion potential customers, but more importantly, there's one billion cheap labor source. Uh, you know, Chinese workers are well educated, well disciplined, and work at a fraction. Uh, of the wage that that's been paid out to the U.S. workers or or even Japanese Korean workers, so they actually there is also a cultural difference in my opinion between uh, American uh, Western in general and uh, Chinese. Chinese are very hard working people. They're very disciplined, and I have a direct, uh, I would say, uh, experience with them. Uh, they're like here to solve a problem. They're not talking about why there is a problem. And how did the problem happen? And they're not turning around the problem. They're solving the problem. And that's why they're efficient. And uh, they also adopted this, uh, I would say, culture on, on the business sector in China. And that is why the Chinese economy is growing, uh, uh, because uh, one plus one equals two. Uh, uh, but in, in, in the West now, one plus one doesn't necessarily mean uh, two because uh, two is now uh, subjective, and, and you know the, uh, this is really serious thing. I'm I'm trying to tell my Western friends here that uh, this is the decline of the Western civilization because when in any society truth um, 
doesn't have a status and it's not respected by the general public. I'm not saying everyone, but there is a considerable number of people, they're rejecting the basic math and the basic biology and the basic facts and, and science uh, when it comes to biology, when it comes to education, when it comes to economy, and they're driven by ideologies. And then they come and they accuse other countries of exporting ideological values. And that's not the case. In my opinion, the United States is driven more by ideology in its foreign policy approach than in China. And we can yes. see this clearly that in different countries, they're going to Africa and they're telling them, we're going to do business with you, but you have to advance the LGBTQ plus community uh, values there. I mean, what, what's the correlation between business and the LGBTQ rights in these countries? That means this, uh, the, the pillars of the US foreign policy isn't mutual interest, isn't based on pure business money interest only, but also on ideology. And this is something that should be clear for everyone. And when it comes to the Chinese-American relationship, the issue of Taiwan is, in my opinion, one of the most important files, right? And the United States considers uh, Taiwan as part of China under one China policy since the 70s, If uh, correct me if I'm wrong. How, but how does China, how does the United States justify its statements and th when they say uh, China, Taiwan is part of China, but we are ready to defend Taiwan? Defend Taiwan against who? Yeah. Um, so for in 1972, when uh, so before 1972, of course, China and U.S. are on the opposite camps in the Cold War. And that started when the Communist Party took power in 1949. And subsequently, um, in 1950, in, in June 1950, at the outbreak of Korean War, that's when President Truman authorized the U.S. 7th Fleet to sail into the Taiwan Strait. This was this was four months before Chinese entry into the Korean War. That's when U.S. already intervened directly into the Chinese Civil War. And this is why the Taiwan issue remained today, because back in 1950, U.S. directly intervened to, to prevent uh, Mao's People's Liberation Army from finishing the job. And, and the, the state of civil war then persisted. Uh, and then you, for about two decades, U.S. War, worked under this illusion that somehow the Jiang Kai-shek's government in Taiwan is a sole representative of entire China. Um, until, until Nixon visit to China, that kind of flip it around. And that's when Nixon signed the uh, Shanghai communique with then Chinese Premier Zhou Enlai, which clearly states that United States recognize that both sides of the Taiwan Strait recognize there's only one China. And, and it's basically a business among Chinese people to settle. It's none of U.S. business. Um, and that forms the cornerstone of the U.S.-China relationship going forward. Uh, so one China policy has always been the official U.S. policy. But that started to change around, uh, I say, around 2010s, because this is when a lot of the um, U.S. political leadership suddenly uh, walk, walk to the fact that China is rising, and the, if if China's rise were allowed to continue, you will become a peer, near peer competitor to United States, and, and that threatens U.S. hegemony, which is which is not allowed, and and from U.S. perspective, and and you mentioned you know about U.S. plans for Syria, uh, you know I remember. The, the NATO Supreme Commander Wesley Clark have talked about this. In 1992, he saw the Pentagon plan to invade like seven or eight country. You know, Syria, it started with Iraq, Syria, Libya. And, and guess what? And they, they, they follow that to the letter. Yeah. And in, in 2015, um, uh, you, former U.S. Ambassador Blackwell, he also uh, put up, put out a proposal on how United States can contain China. And his plan is being followed to the T. You know, his plan, Jeffrey Sachs just talked about this a few days ago, by the way. He, he, people can, can go listen to that interview uh, he gave to uh, um, in Vienna. And he mentioned the fact that the Blackwell plan was um, to build an economic order without China, you know, to try to loop in all these Asian economies that we're talking about, Taiwan, South Korea, uh, uh, Japan, 
uh, but without engaging China. So, so they try to recreate the Cold War, um, recreate Cold War 2.0, because Cold War is what United States know how to win, right? They, they say, okay, yeah. we'll just uh, revert back to the Cold War. We isolate China as we did back then, isolate Soviet Union, and then, then let China collapse under its own weight. But China is not Soviet Union, not not the China in 2023. China is very much embedded into the global system. Now China is a number one trading nation with the world. If China tried, to, if United States tried to cut China off, uh, in effect, United States is cutting itself off from the rest of yeah. the world. Um, so yeah. what what United States is trying to do is they trying to build a a a wall around its allies. So, so it's all the the European Union. <clears throat> plus Japan, plus South Korea, plus Australia, and 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 it's pushing really hard. Um, you know, its European allies and its Asian allies to to toe the line, which actually goes against their interests. For example, Australia's largest trading partner is China, yeah. <laughs> and you know their their largest customer is China, and and with. And Germany, Germany now the Chinese premier Li Chang is in Germany uh, just just now, and because Germany's largest export market is China, the, Germany has already lost out one of its leg of its economy, the cheap energy source, the gas from Russia. The other remaining leg for the German economy is its trade with China, especially for German auto manufacturers, and and yet Washington is putting immense pressure. For Germany to fall into line to to sanction China, for and this is this is this is also again we come back also it's not only the United States that is pressuring but also Germany again is following its ideological uh, uh, patterns uh, with China. Remember what Annalena Baerbock uh, said when she was in China. It, it I, I, my only comment was like oh my god, oh my god. Oh my God, what is she doing in China? You traveled to China all the way to try to speak about Ukraine and Chinese and German relationship. And she went there and she is criticizing China over its human rights record. She's mentioning uh, Xinjiang. And she knows quite well, believe me, these people know quite well that the most of the reports that they receive are from intelligence uh, apparatuses. And they're not necessarily correct, but they repeat and repeat and repeat, and they believe in the same lies that they are circulating around. And the same thing applied on Syria. So I'm not surprised at all. Like, imagine that uh, uh, Germany already shut one of its legs uh, by uh, after the Ukraine war uh, by stopping the Nord Stream, that the Americans, of course, blew it up. Now they're trying to blame on, on, on Ukraine. <laughs> and on the Ukrainians, it's like they're pushing them under the bus, under the train, not even a bus. And Annalena Baerbock is now lecturing... Um, um, uh, China. And I remember there was a conversation between Trudeau and Xi Jinping, if you remember, I think two years yes. ago, when she when she was bashing uh, Trudeau and telling him why did he leak the, the talks to the media. And that uh, clown, sorry, but the, the only way to describe him, he said, uh, oh, we have freedom of press here in our country. Like, it's like, this is a secret talks between you and the leader of other country. You leaked it to the media. That's not about freedom of press. You were deliberately trying to tarnish the, the talks with the Chinese side. So it's become very difficult now uh, for China as a rational actor uh, in China, uh, Russia as a rational actor. You have rational uh, politicians. Yeah, you the, the agree or thing- this... The best thing about that Trudeau video is that everybody loved it. You know, not not just the Chinese, the Canadians loved it too. Everybody want Trudeau to get a dress down like he yeah, deserved, yeah. you know, by, by a responsible adult. And, yeah. <laughs> and these people, I mean, like like the example of Ber- Baerbach, if you look at her career path, I mean, she was groomed by the Atlantis institution from very early age. These are, they, they do not represent the German interest. They, they, re, they are just a voice for the Washington. You know, Burbach, why did she go to China? She didn't go to China to talk to the Chinese leaders. She went to China to use as a photo op, uh, as a soapbox, to show that, oh, okay, I am doing Washington's bidding. I am talking tough on China. And and this is this does nothing to further German interest in China. It's not helping German Germany selling more cars in China. Far from that. Uh, you know, it's and, and same thing with uh, von 
uh, Wang, uh, Von der Leyen. Von der Leyen. You know, like, I never <laughs> figured out what the hell is her job. You know, like, I want to be that guy, the management consultant guy from the American movie office space. I want to go in and ask her, so exactly <laughs> what do you do? And of course, her answer will probably be like, I'm a people's person. I talk person. to people from Washington. Yeah. And I know. So that's what, that's the, how these people get their jobs. And they are so, um, they're so cut off from the ordinary people of Europe, the ordinary people of Germany, and and because they they are their bread and butter is 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 getting butter on the other side of the Atlantic, and, yeah. and so and they understand that, so they ha- they told the line and yeah, and uh, it's uh, we live in a bizarre world, Korvac. <laughs> yeah. Carl, I want to mention something here. Uh, I know, um, uh, let's say, Eastern culture is a little bit different from the West. We know quite well how the United States uh, functions, like you already mentioned. Uh, When uh, Syria, which is a very tiny country, when they receive a European uh, uh, official or representative, the, the first question they ask them, are you representing your country or are you representing the United States? This is the first question they get asked. So just like you mentioned, when Baerbock went to uh, China, uh, she was trying uh, to represent the United States, not the, her country. And similarly, recently, when Baerbock went to Saudi Arabia, and this is my own sources, diplomatic sources here in Berlin, uh, sh- she was asked by the United States to go to Saudi Arabia and try to fix the relationship with Saudi Arabia because Saudi Arabia is too important for them uh, to lose. And now you also say uh, that the Chinese side is talking to uh, Bill Gates and uh, Elon Musk and other billionaires because they want to cut out the uh, the middleman, right? It's becoming it's becoming a chariot. It's becoming a circus now. We don't really know with who we should uh, we should speak because in uh, uh, with their incompetence and with the uh, the vagueness in their approaches uh, toward our countries, it becomes very difficult to uh, deal with them and to advance our national interest. It's also becoming a, a burden on, on Syria and on China and Russia and other countries. But China is showing a different approach, for example, uh, toward the Middle East. Uh, Beijing uh, striked uh, or meddled, uh, mediated a deal between Saudi Arabia and Iran. They were uh, struggling over influence in the region for a very long time. And now China uh, uh, received the uh, president of the Palestinian Authority, Mahmoud Abbas, and they say that they have established a strategic partnership with Palestine. Um, Do you think these agreements, Saudi, Iranian agreement, and now with Palestine worries Israel and how the Chinese role would be different in the Middle East and the United States in Europe? Oh, yeah, yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm sure Israel is worried. So <clears throat> the Chinese involvement in the Middle East is actually very interesting because uh, China always supported the Palestinian cause. I mean, even from the, the, the Maoist days, uh, I, I remember I grew up, so I, I was born in 1976, one month after Mao died. Um, and I grew up in China in 1980s. And I remember in 1980s, you know, watching TV, seeing the Palestinian Authority delegation come visiting China. That was a regular occurrence. Yasser Arafat visited China many, many times. And so in that front, China, which is just reiterating its support for Palestine, but at the same time, by upgrading the relationship to a strategic partnership, that's actually quite unprecedented Um, Mm -hmm. because China also, uh, especially after Deng Xiaoping came to power, Deng Xiaoping said, "Okay, we're going to stop exporting revolution. We're going to stop exporting ideology. We're just going to do business. Uh, you know, we practice what's so what's called non-interference policy. We we don't interfere in other people's domestic politics. We just want to do business." And uh, initially, Israel was very receptive to that because they, Israel wanted to drew China away from its support of uh, its, his historical support of Palestine. So Israel tried to, um, uh, um, you know, get on the great good graces of China by um, uh, corporate, they, they cooperated with China on many fronts. So for example, um, you know, as we all know, Israel have a very close relationship with United States. They have they're getting a lot of uh, U.S. technology and, and U.S. US Israel kind of, Pose itself as a conduit from where U.S. technology can flow to China. So there, there was a case when um, the time when Israel tried to develop its own indigenous fighter jet 
um, based on F-16. They, 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 so Israel, they designed this uh, new, new fighter jet called Lavi. And then the U.S. heard about it. U.S. is not very happy. Uh, you know, the U.S. like, no, well, why, why, are you dev- why are you trying to copycat our, our design? We, we want to sell F-16s around the world. We don't want to comp- competition. So they, they put their foot down and, and Israel have to stop their own fighter jet program. But now they want to still salvage some of that investment they put in. So they, they, they approach China. And they say, okay, we can sell our almost finished Lavi uh, fight jet, uh, fighter jet program to you. And, and that, that deal went through again. But when Washington find out about it, they put their foot down. They told Israelis, what the hell are you doing? You know, they, 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 they cut, uh, cut that. They, they made sure is, Israel stopped that military to military cooperation with China. Well, not before China already acquired that technology. So some military uh, analysts think that's, that's how the Chinese fighter jet uh, J-10 got its start from uh, the, the transfer of technology from Israel to China. Um, and even when Xi Jinping proposed the Belt and Road Initiative, you know, Israel tried to sign up. They're trying to dangle the prospect of having Ch- Chinese investment to come into Israel to develop their port. Again, that alarmed Washington. Washington put its foot down. I mean, a lot of people think Israel is the one calling the shots in the in the real Israeli U.S. relationship, but I I think it's other other way around because especially come to the U.S. Israel China relationship, Israel actually didn't have a form of sovereignty on decide what it can do and cannot do with China because every time Washington will come down and say no, you're not allowed to do that, you're not allowed to join the BRI, and 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 you should not get Chinese firms to involve in developing your port and. And so now, uh, and, and, and so increasingly in the last few years, a lot of the right wing Israeli politicians have been lining up behind Washington, for example, accusing China of committing genocide on Uyghur. Israel. Israel yeah. is accusing China persecuting their Muslim population, right? I mean, there's no hypocrisy in that at all. And and so, I mean, in this light, I think it kind of makes sense for, for China to even double down on its uh, support for the Palestinian cause. I mean, well, mm-hmm. <laughs> like, I mean, Israel obviously doesn't have a, a, a independent foreign policy. And under the current arrangement, there's not much uh, hope for improvement over there. You know, why, why not continue the traditional relationship China has with the PLA leadership? Um, and, 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 and the the latest development in, in Chinese role in Middle East is actually quite interesting because Prior, as I said, China pursues a non-interference policy, which means China can maintain a sort of friendship with Iran, Saudi Arabia, and Israel at the same time. Yes. Because, because China come in, they just want to do business. China, we don't want to get involved of your fight, you, you know, your fight, you know, whether Shia versus uh, Sunni or, or Israel versus the Arab world. We're just interested in doing business. And, and in a way, that does have certain appeal because China is not coming in telling people what they can or cannot do. And, and, and I think but Carl, the, but Carl there ahead. is this there is this uh, concern, and I will end up the, this conversation with you with this question because you already mentioned that China doesn't want to intervene in domestic affairs or exports its model uh, into other countries. But there are uh, people, and we, uh, we encounter them in every day, especially on Twitter, who oppose U.S. imperialism, but are also the cautious of the Chinese and the also Russian uh, rise and this uh, shift from unipolarity to multipolarity because they say. Uh, that the the Chinese and the Russian models are authoritarian. There is a social credit system in China, and this could reflect to, uh, on their own countries. And uh, the Chinese and the Russian side uh, could also try to export their models, right? Because there is also a historical experience with uh, Russia under, let's say, Soviet Union, that they tried to export their model in uh, East European countries, and some of these people do not want that. Yeah. Well, first of all, China and Russia today is very different from China and Soviet Union in the Cold War. I mean, first of all, a lot of people don't realize Russia is not communist anymore. <laughs> I mean, many Americans still believe Russia is Soviet yes. Union. I mean, Russia couldn't be further away from its communist path. 
past. And, uh, you know, Putin said that many times, you know, he thinks the uh, Soviet Union was a tragedy <laughs> that happened to, to Russia. Yes. So, um, and, 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 and Russia is just another country that wants to be respected for being a great power. Um, I, I mean, same same thing for China. They are not trying to export their uh, whatever gov- governance model. I mean, whatever your people's opinion of China, Chinese policy primarily impacts the Chinese citizen living inside China. Like, if you, I'm a, I'm a I'm a I'm a person with a U.S. passport. I'm far more concerned about U.S. government holding my data than the Chinese because. There's nothing Chinese government can do to me. <laughs> they don't have jurisdiction <laughs> over me. But U.S. government claim jurisdiction over everybody. You know, it doesn't matter if you're American or not, even if you're British. I just met with uh, Julian Assange. Exactly. Perfect, perfect exactly. You, they they claim the global cop status, and and I understand why people have this concern because they are so used. They are so used to the U.S. hegemony. Right, they cannot conceive another, a different model. They they just, they just assume everybody must be like the Americans. It's if, every, if the Americans are displaced from the global hegemon, they just mean another he- global hegemon come to its place. But that's not what the multipolarity is all about. The multipolar, <laughs> the, the, the 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 China and Russia strive for multipolarity is they're saying, look, we are all great powers, um, like we. Want to be respected in our in our um, you know in our role as a great power, you you know we don't recognize your role as a global hegemon that hold over other nations. You know each each individual countries should have their own sovereign rights to determine their own path. That's what multipolarity polarity is really about. It's a, they're they're not neither China or Russia is trying to. Um, you know, trying to spread their model all over the world. They, they, they're not trying to paint the world red like back in 19, <laughs> I don't know, 1950, 1960, 1970s. Um, we have seen this in Syria, Carl. In, uh, the Russians have enormous influence over Russia after 2015, and uh, uh, it's a Russian federation. And, uh, for example, when it comes to the uh, conflict between the Syrian government and the Kurdish militias in the east, uh, that they are uh, embedded with the U.S. occupation forces, the Russians... Uh, uh, suggested and uh, sent a recommendation that uh, if Syria uh, changes its constitution and we become a federal country, the Kurds would have their uh, some autonomy uh, there. But they didn't force it on the Damascus government, and Damascus said no. And we're not going to discuss this. There is a there is a, a constitutional committee, and we discuss it in with our partners and also uh, foes, let's say, like these militias, and we see where uh, what can we reach, uh, what agreement can we reach. But the Russians didn't come and say, "Look, we saved you, we saved your ass from uh, from ISIS, and we have now a military bases here, and you're going to do what we go- we are telling you." They didn't dictate it, and I know this for, like a hundred percent. This is not a uh, reports. This is not uh, some speculation. Those are facts uh, that happened on the ground, and uh, I'm happy uh, that the Russians and the Chinese have this approach because it benefits uh, um, uh, also people's experiences. People uh, develop. Uh, their uh, future based on their experiences and each country has different culture history and they have to find their way out if you, if 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 the americans come and destroy entire iraq to make it democratic it won't work these people have to develop their own uh, political system and this is something very important that the chinese and the russians are doing and i'm i'm i'm, I'm probably i'm sounding biased toward them but this is the fact that we have on a personal experience with the chinese and uh, with the russians who have very big Business interest now in Syria in terms of reconstruction that they can start reconstructing the country and they will gain also billions out of it so they can even choose the path that Syria can go in the near future but until then Carl thank you really very much for your time that you dedicated uh, for me and also for the audience of Syriana analysis I'm sure they appreciate your insight it was very important I think we overall discussed the Chinese foreign policy in different parts of the world and also the multipolarity and how the Chinese and the Russian role could be different from the American one and let's hope that uh, peace would prevail soon in Ukraine I really uh, uh, do not want to see anyone is dying because we saw it in Syria and it's a horrible and tragic thing. Thank you so much, Carl. 
Thank you, Kervoy. And guys, thank you very much for tuning in. I've been your host, Kirk Almasena of Syriana Analysis. If you are new, please subscribe and share this video with your friends if you want others to see and learn from uh, Carl's insight. And if you want to support my independent work like this one, you can become a patron. Link in the description below. And see you next time.